Hi, uh, welcome everyone to our horizon scanning discussion on the future of the environmental sciences and the mega trends and drivers for change that may be shaping that future. Uh, my name is Joseph, I'm policy lead at the IES and I'll be hosting the discussion today. Today's event is part of the IES's Future of ES23 Horizon Scanning and Foresight project, where we're bringing together voices from across the environmental sciences through discussions like this one, with the goal of creating a vision statement that sets out the different potential futures for the environmental sciences as well as uh, how we can create the kind of future that we would like to see. Naturally, as with all foresight, there's a degree of uncertainty to that, and we can best resolve that through rich conversations and widespread collaboration, which is why we're so thankful to all of you for joining us and being here today. If you want more information about the project, it's available on the IES website, links to which will be posted in the chat once we get started. In fact, I think it's popping up already. Uh, we've, we've already held two other virtual events as part of this, published two thought pieces, and this week we also released a briefing paper on drivers for change and megatrends to help support the kind of conversations that we're going to be having today. Today's event will be recorded, made available through the IES website and YouTube channel. In a moment, I'll be handing over to our expert panel of speakers to set the scene for us and our conversation today. And I'll give them a quick introduction now, but as we call them up to speak a little bit later, I'll also give you a little more information about their background and some of their credentials. So first, we're going to be hearing from Hugh Williams from Sami Consulting, who will introduce us to the topic of drivers for change and megatrends, what we can expect to drive change into the future, and how we can approach that change. After Hugh, our next speaker is going to be Penelope Tollett of Making Places Together. Penelope is going to be bringing our focus to the specifics of urbanisation and some of the context around our urban environments, which is relevant in the global context, but also potentially quite pertinent in the UK, which maybe has a, a different flavour of urbanisation. We'll maybe hear some of, some of that from Penelope later. And then the final speaker opening today's event will be Professor David Viner, who wears many hats, but who uh, perhaps most pertinently for today's discussion is co-chair of the UK, uh, the UK Climate Programme's Knowledge Network. So perhaps unsurprisingly, David's going to be talking to us about climate change. After those presentations, we'll then pop into breakout discussions where everyone will have the chance to share their views on the future of the environmental sciences, to discuss what the speaker said and to engage in horizon scanning into the influence of megatrends and their impact on the future. Once those discussions are completed, there'll be a chance to ask your questions to the panel. So please do submit those in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the discussions, the presentations, or indeed at any point during the event. We'll then put those questions to your panelists later on. And if you have more general comments, feel free to add those in the chat box throughout, which you should be able to do. So thank you for logging in. Um, I'm now going to hand over to our panel of speakers, starting with Hugh. Hugh has over 20 years of experience of strategy development at the leading edge of change and new business development in the telecoms, internet and e-commerce arenas. He has been a principal at Sami Consulting since 2010, most recently delivering a scenario project for the EC Research and Innovation Directorate on R&I futures, including space, in various regions of the world. He's also completed horizon scanning projects for DEFRA in partnership with Natural England, the Environment Agency, Food Standards Agency and Welsh Government, for the Department for Transport and for Scottish Water. So, Hugh. Over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Joseph. Um, welcome everybody. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to, to talk to you about our Sami Consulting's drivers of change. Okay, uh, right, well, at Sami Consulting, we're, we're a foresight and futures uh, consultancy, helping people think about the way future works and our strap line is robust decisions in uncertain times, and they're pretty uncertain at the moment. Um, and we regularly maintain a uh, horizon scan of our key drivers of change, um, identifying changes and things that are moving on in those areas and uh, what we think the implications of those will be. Um, so, one thing we can be fairly sure about the future is it will be different. And the ways in which it's different, it's hard to tell. Okay, so we characterize our drivers of change in this way with six different ones. Um, other people will uh, have slightly different formulations of this, but they're all broadly the same in many ways. Um, so we have population dynamics, which uh, mainly is driven by demographics and migration, um, also urbanization, which Penelope will be talking about shortly. We talk about geopolitics and the implications that that has for different dynamics for different countries and the way uh, things move, in particular about economic growth and inequality. Um, we have set one stream on climate breakdown. Um, and David, no doubt, will, I won't spend much time on that because David will no doubt deal with much of that. Um, 
So we have two technology ones. One we regard as the digital technologies, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, um, and the second strand of biotech uh, developments. The final one is uh, changing social attitudes. And I think this, this is one that interests me uh, a great deal. Um, and it's one that people often overlook when they think about the future, they tend to focus on the, on the technology rather than the, the social attitudes and the social environment, particularly. Okay, so under the demographics or population dynamics, um, in what, some ways this is one of the least uncertain drivers of change because you can actually see uh, what's going on with the existing populations and the populations don't necessarily change that rapidly. But one of these things that uh, I suppose has become perhaps an increasing surprise over the last couple of years is an awareness that actually the world population is going to peak much sooner than had previously been thought. For much of my life, everyone was concerned about um, continuing grow growth in world population and the strains that were put on resources and the environment and so forth. Um, but the world population is now forecast to peak around 2065 and will then start to fall. Even in China, last year was a peak of its population. Um, and then it is starting to fall now. India is larger and still still growing, um, and so will be increasingly important. But even that, by the, before the end of the, of the century, will be uh, starting to decline. The only areas that are still growing will really be uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where the growth is mainly driven by increasing longevity. Uh, rather than by um, actually uh, increasing numbers of births. Because all around the world, we're seeing falling fertility rates. Um, and these are quite uh, quite surprising, really. Um, 183 out of 195 countries uh, will not have uh, fertility rates high enough to sustain their populations by the end of the century. Many will actually see the population fall by half. That is really quite a dramatic thing to be looking at uh, within the end of the century. Japan is currently at 1.3 births per woman, when of course the replacement, replacement rate is 2.1. Even in the UK, we're at 1.56. So uh, we're actually seeing uh, more people uh, being die uh, um, than are born annually by, by 2025. So the total UK population would start to would shrink by 2058 in the UK, um, were it not for migration. So one of the things that's uh, starting to become intriguing is that if you are looking at lots of migration coming from certain parts of the world, um, perhaps these countries with, with lower fertility rates might begin competing for immigrants, that, it, that you actually have a different attitude to uh, what immigrants can bring to your country. Otherwise, you have an aging population with pressures that puts on the welfare system and its impact on GDP. So if you can recruit uh, able-bodied, dynamic young people, then that's exactly what you need to adapt your, your population structure. Um, and as Penelope will talk, talk about, uh, we are seeing uh, increasing urbanization um, across the globe. In some areas much uh, better planned than others, um, but it's an increasing feature we're seeing uh, all around the world. So in terms of geopolitics, um, the major, well, obviously the major thing at the moment is Russia and Ukraine. Um, so I won't dwell on that because you'll know, all know about that and the impacts that will have. But the whole um, way in which economic growth is moving and the implications that's having for politics um, it is quite intriguing. The impact on supply chains is dramatic, um, and people are actually having to reorganize and restructure their supply chains. In an environment where you've got a, a lot of authoritarianism and populist uh, regimes around the world um, who are resistant to migration, and that will be in, in increasing tension. Um, we've got the Brexit position in the UK. China is one of the more interesting ones. It, China could go in any number of directions, and because of its size and power, um, is particularly important to watch out for. We've had regional confrontations where um, they've taken over South China Sea Islands, 
Um, some of the analysis says that if they were to invade Taiwan, there's not much the West could do about it. Um, changing trade balances are happening, but there are also actually uh, internal tensions sort of, uh, rising uh, rapidly within China as well. And uh, my colleagues and I have a bet on whether President Xi will last the year or not. So uh, it's quite a challenge, I think. We are seeing the growth in African, uh, African countries, which goes with uh, what they call a demographic dividend. Um, so there are lots of young people who are enabling GDP to grow. But Nigeria is a particular example. By the end of the century, it will be ninth place in the world rankings of GDPs. And all of those are leading through to new military cyber threats. And this is happening in a range uh, environment where you have uh, uh, great inequalities with the richest 1% capturing all 63% of new wealth growth, according to a recent Oxfam report. So that's uh, really quite an important factor going on there. The next area is climate breakdown, and um, David is more expert than I in the whole of this area, so I'm sure he'll take you through things there. Um, we've seen in recent um, months and last year that um, much more evidence of climate crisis actually hitting home, that adaptation plans are generally insufficient. The COP27 uh, event really failed to extend the net zero targets that COP26 had come up with, um, which a um, group called Climate Action Tracker uh, would now reckon that a 1.8 degrees centigrade rise would be optimistic, and they think we're probably looking more at uh, 2.5 as a, a sort of mid range. That leads to an ecosystem collapse threat. Um, and I think I've already seen in the chat somebody mentioning that. Um, on the upside, we are seeing that uh, renewable energy is coming through very rapidly, that solar, solar and wind are becoming cheaper than the fossil fuel equivalents. And you're seeing that leads to more diversified and decentralized sources of energy. Um, and the economic viability of low carbon storage is happening as well. So. Uh, um, although there's huge challenges, we are making some progress. We don't have to be totally pessimistic. Fourth industrial revolution, um, obviously, it was with the uh, pandemic and everything went online. Um, we're all very much used to that. Um, you probably have heard a lot of talk about chat GPT, a recent chatbot with AI capabilities. At the moment, it's, it's capabilities uh, using large language models. It's probably good at information gathering out of the whole of the incident rather than in insightful analysis. Um, but there are things there that uh, are worth watching out for. Um, we also flag up um, smart countryside and so forth. A lot of concern about AI systems replacing uh, humans. And people say, oh, well, they don't have the empathy that humans have, but AI has been shown to be better at rate, re recognizing facial expressions than, than humans. So it's not all uh, a one-way street there. One of the new applications of drones I particularly like is a combination of 3D printing, uh, where drones are being sent into disaster zones with 3D printing to print, print emergency shelters um, for the populations that are there. Um, generally, they used in, in surveys rather than anything else. Biotech is probably going to be one of the biggest leaps forward over the next 10 years. Um, AI is, is huge, but the, the biotechnology opportunities are dramatic. Um, precision me medicine coming from the use of CRISPR and epigenome ed editing, um, which is which is CRISPR on steroids, so it's an even more flexible way of doing it, um, is dramatic. Like with AI, there will be several ethical issues to address and misuse. Um, I think I should have mentioned in AI is the whole threat of deep fakes and the challenge of actually understanding what is true anymore. Um, so that will be a big issue, but there are main, many ethical issues around biotech as well. And the applications are, are fairly obvious to start with, which are climate change uh, things around drought tolerant cat cattle and disease resistant plants. Um, but we'll, there are many more things coming here that we've yet to really get our heads about. And finally, in this very rapid canter through the, uh, the changes, um, we're seeing generational differences that you're getting embedded. And it used to be the way feeling that uh, attitudes would uh, change in predictable ways as one got older. 
I'm not saying that's so, so much of the amount of cohorts are taking the experience of their, their youth with them as they grow up. And the you know, current Gen Z are working through their financial insecurity, generation rent, boomerang children. Um, current generations drink and smoke less, um, but they tend to be more obese and have more mental health issues. And so there's actually uh, been uh, changing challenges for the health system uh, emerging out of that. So as I said, that's been a pretty rapid canter through some of the trends, a whole list of wildcard cards so you can play fun, fun and games of the daytime. One of my current concerns is um, collisions in, among satellites. I think that could make huge, uh, be a huge challenge to much of the way we do business. Um, but there are plenty of other things there which uh, you can worry about if you want to sleep last night. There are ways of coping with change, forecasting scenarios, or uh, Taleb's anti-fragile concept. Um, but generally, I think it, we have to see the changes happening all, all over the place in complex and interrelated ways. You can think about it um, and put some plans in place. And there are ways to manage, manage it going forward. Thank you. For, I think it was a great presentation and a really useful introduction to the ways that the world is changing. You've given us a lot to think about at a very rapid pace, so we'll give people a little bit of time to percolate those thoughts before they put them to you in questions later on. Um, but as we continue for now, our next speaker is going to be Penelope Tollett. Uh, Penelope is an urban designer and planner. She's worked in a number of planning departments, including in Bath, Kensington and Chelsea, and most recently Wickham, where she was head of planning and sustainability. She now runs her own planning consultancy, Making Places Together, and she's a visiting lecturer at UCL. She's a design council expert, chairs the Berkshire, Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire and Milton Keynes Design Network and is a director of planning officers, society enterprises, and a member of the Town and Country Planning Association Policy Council, as well as a recent past chairman of the RTPI's England Policy Panel. So Penelope, over to you. I feel a bit of a charlatan presenting to you because uh, the two people on either side of me are experts in their field. I'm not really an expert in the mega trend of urbanisation, but as has just been said, I am a planner. So I'm quite an unusual breed in the IES because my experience is about urbans rather than about natural systems. Um, but uh, OK, nonetheless, I hope I've got something that's helpful to say to you. Um, the world has been urban since 2007. So that was the time that more than half of the world's population were living in urban areas rather than living in rural areas. And cities, the, 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 the language is interchangeable, cities or um, urban areas 60% generate 60% of global GDP, 70% of carbon emissions and 60% of resource use, which actually isn't really that surprising if we are approaching 60% of the population living in those areas and that's, the, that's expected by 2030. So it all sort of fits together in a rather sad way. Um, the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, you'll all be familiar with number 11, making human cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. They have a number of indicators as to what makes, uh, uh, you know, what we should be doing to try to get, get ourselves into a good place in, in terms of the urban environment. This is a slide of, of municipal waste. It's the bottom line on the graph that is the most relevant because it shows that 25% of the world's population don't have waste collections. And this is uh, obviously not then saying anything about what happens to that waste once it's been collected. And neither does it say anything about the fact that um, the amount of waste that is expected. So we currently have about 2 billion metric tons of waste and that will rise to about 4 billion metric tons by 2050. I can't visualize what 4 billion metric tons is, but I know it's an awful lot. So we have an issue of waste. Um, transport is a critical factor. Uh, and this graph um, is slightly misleading because the top bar is 80%, not 100%. So it's showing that only 50% of the world's population has access to public transport. Um, we have air pollution, which uh, although the first two that I've shared, waste and transport, are getting better over time, air quality is not getting better over time. Nine out of 10 urban residents in 2016 were breathing polluted air. Um, and uh, we also, of course, going back to the first slide, have the uh, seemingly eternal issue of slums. 
Uh, more than a billion people live in slums across the world, uh, which is, of course, one in eight of the world's population. But when you look at it as a percentage of the urban population, it's a quarter of people are living in slums. And clearly, across the world, they vary. Different, different regions of the world have more or fewer people living in slums. But the real point about slums is not so much their physical appearance and their physical depri the deprivation that they cause, um, but it's the social inequality that comes with it. And it was really interesting to hear Hugh's um, observation about, I've now long since forgotten the actual statistic that was on his slide because my short-term memory is hopeless, but uh, the 1% have got 63% of growth of the world or something like that, he said. So the, the issue of inequality must not be forgotten. But what I want to do is put this into a historical context and remind us that urbanization and the inverted commas megatrend of urbanization is nothing new. This is one of Cruikshank's famous cartoons. Uh, this one is 1829, so it's nearly 200 years old. This happens to have been inspired by Brixton, uh, but in fact, it's exactly the same now in, in terms of the things that are driving it and the consequences of what is happening, even if it might look different in different places. And uh, Britain was the first country globally to become a majority of urban livers. Uh, and that it was the 1851 census that showed that we had tipped over that threshold. And just to um, make the point that, that things are not new, here is a, um, a map of uh, 1680 England and 1830 England showing the number of transport routes that had developed. Now, part of that is background growth. I do, I do recognize that this, this isn't purely urbanization, which is much more the transfer of people from rural communities into urban areas. But transport is still one of the key causes or factors involved with uh, increasing urbanization. And just again, to make the point about the, the scale of growth, here we are in 1841 with lots of people. Again, part of that is background growth, but it's the um, period between sort of 1800 and 1850, where we had a uh, considerable depopulation of the countryside. And I think we forget when we look at what's happening in developing countries, we forget that the, we went through the same process of land becoming increasingly, if I can use the shorthand, privatised people having to move to the cities, whether they wanted to or not. But actually quite a lot of people wanting to move to the cities because they had better opportunities, they could get to education, the old saying, the streets of London are paved with gold. You know, it's part of our, our um, sort of psyche that you can, you can get on better if you live in a city than if you live in a rural area. Some of the main impacts, um, these are fairly universal. I found this um, diagram is actually from Chinese research, but it could apply anywhere. We have cultural impacts, um, uh, particularly loss of rural tradition, which um, we, we, I think we've long since forgotten that we ever had one in the UK, uh, but it's certainly still the case in developing countries. Obviously, ecological impacts, social impacts, loss, loss of social capital as communities get broken up, economic impacts with increasing inequality and also political Im impacts with unequal rights and so forth. But the thing I really want to um, ask a question about is whether we're right even to regard urbanization as the megatrend, because urbans are the symptom in many ways. They're not actually the cause. Um, an urban area expresses the social and economic systems that are operating in that society. And it is, it is the thing that we see, it is the visible byproduct of that, but it is not arguably the engine. The engine is the economy. And here we have a diagram that shows the city uh, as one inner box. And then we have the support region, as it calls it, the outer box, including agriculture and, our, and the appropriation of the rural landscape around the city in order to feed people and not just the people obviously adjacent to the city anymore. And then the wider ecosystem services on which we all depend. So um, having taken you back to 1829, I'm now going to take you back to um, about 4,000 or 5,000 years um, deliberately because this chap, Gilgamesh, I dare say he didn't really look like this, but anyway, this, this person was is the subject of the oldest story that is recorded in writing that we know of um, on Earth. Um, and he was a king 
who lived sometime four to five thousand years ago. The, the writing, the, 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 the written records we have are from about four thousand years ago. And this guy lived um, up the river from where Abraham was living in Ur, and we all know about Abraham, so sort of rough, roughly the same time. And uh, Gilgamesh was a king, and he wanted a new palace, and he wanted that palace to be built of cedar, uh, but he didn't have any cedar in his kingdom, so he trotted off out into what I take from these stories, although obviously it's all quite a lot of circumspection, into land that really wasn't owned by anybody. Um, had an argument with the spirit that protected the trees, cut them down, took them home and suffered some ill fate as a consequence. Now, why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because actually nothing's changed. And one of the things that I think we need to understand as environmental scientists is the cultural tug of the human condition, that we've been doing this, we've been appropriating landscape for urban purposes, for human purposes, um, for literally millennia. And um, in many ways, this is this is an expression of imperialism, just as much as uh, Britain walking into India was an expression of imperialism. Um, so let me just get back on track, because I do risk going off track with uh, bringing Gilgamesh into the story. Um, so back to the present day, we're, we're familiar with images of this nature. Just from this photograph, we can see unsafe housing, unsanitary housing, uh, lack of waste collection, severance by a railway line, and clearly very limited opportunities. Um, now, we assume that things in England, I will talk, I'll use the word England because the systems are different across the, the UK. Um, we would assume that it's different. I and mean, here we have a nice new suburb, deliberately anonymous, but we can see it's probably in Cornwall or somewhere like that. Um, used as the front cover of the UK government's um, planning reform paper in 2020, the white paper, which has now actually been dropped and we're now waiting for the next form of, of planning reform. But what struck, struck me and struck many of my colleagues about this photograph is there isn't a single tree in it. We have a new suburb without any greenery. We have a new suburb which is severed by the bypass that goes across the front of the photograph. Um, sure, these buildings are not falling down. I'm not in any way trying to make the case that this is similar to a slum. It clearly isn't. But we in the UK are a long way from building the type of urban environment that we need to be building if we are to um, create good human habitat, because we as humans are part of the natural order of things and we can't live in an isolated bubble. There's an, a bit of an obsession in planning at the moment about beauty. Uh, and I wish we were we were not obsessed with beauty. Um, and so really, in terms of the English planning system, which I feel obliged to mention, uh, it is fairly broken at the moment, which is distressing. Uh, and it's it's not helping us deal with the bigger issues of integrating environment with built environments. Um, but having said that, if we sit there and wait for the planning system to rescue us, if I can put it in that term, um, we'll be waiting a long time because the planning system is only a means of regulating a market, just as Ofcom will regulate media people and so on and so forth. It can't invent a new system. Uh, so the, the, the way our economy operates means that we get um, thing, we get, we get, we build things that do not properly take into account environmental or social consequences. And the, only the corners can be knocked off of that through a planning system. So in my view, if we're going to tackle the mega trend of urbanization, we need to start shifting our worldview, which is easy to say and very hard to do, especially when we link back to Gilgamesh. But we're all very familiar with the, the Venn diagram where we balance things. But whenever anybody shows this diagram, I remember Al Gore talking about, ha, huh, we'll find we can't eat gold bars. Do you remember that from The Inconvenient Truth? Um, so again, nothing new in this. Um, this is this, the, the alternative diagram of the economy being nested within society, being nested within the environment, each constraining the one which which can, is, is contained within it. I can remember being shown this diagram when I was a student over 30 years ago, and you think, um, well, it hasn't had any impact. We still don't understand that we operate within the constraints of the environment. Part of that is perhaps because each individual action, especially as a planner, you know, a planning application, it's cutting down one tree. Well, that's clearly not going to uh, break the planet, is it? Uh, well, yeah, actually, it could do. 
we need to understand the incremental changes. And one of the things that I find most helpful and therefore hopeful is all the work about the nine planetary boundaries, usually shown as concentric rings, but actually this was clearer for my, for my slide um, because that actually sets the science around it. It allows us to understand, although these are very big things, we can understand how the individual action does actually contribute towards those boundaries. So in terms of the urban environment and how do we deliver an urban environment that actually meets the social and environmental needs of the future, the, the work of Kate Raworth with Donut Economics is extremely helpful, not least conceptually, because she's decided that it's neither um, a set of a Venn diagrams of interlocking circles, nor indeed a series of concentric rings, but that the environment, that the economy sits constrained between the planetary boundaries and the social needs. And the economy operates within that donut between those two sets of limitations. And uh, if, although it, it is quite conceptual, the work around donut economics, it is beginning to be practiced. Amsterdam is quite an example where they're beginning to look at the indicators they need to follow in order to try to drive the right direction of change and to begin to get that system change. Although ultimately that will only come when the ec economics actually value what it is that we have and what we need to work within, because if we don't work within it, we don't have it in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Penelope. I thought that was a really great presentation. It was really interesting to think about urbanisation in, in that historical context and how that emerges out of the, the economic context, the human element, and of course, uh, spanning the environmental context as well via Gilgamesh. Uh, it's a it's a really strong systems dimension to that. Uh, I think it's really fascinating how that might interact with some of the other elements of this as we carry on. Uh, before we do, it's been pointed out to me that the Q&A function is in fact not working quite as intended. Uh, so please feel free to put any of your questions into the chat box and we can play it from there as we carry on. Uh, for now, though, our final panellist is uh, going to be Professor David Viner. Uh, David has nearly 30 years of experience working across global climate change and sustainability. Spanning the private sector, policy, academic and NGO communities. He has far too many credentials for me to read all of them out. But as a quick highlight reel, David started his career at the world-renowned Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia, at which he is a visiting professor. From 2007, he was a principal specialist for climate change at Natural England. In 2012, David joined Mott MacDonald, where he helped to transform and position the group as a world leader in developing climate resilience solutions. And David has been involved with the IPCC since 1992. He was a lead author on the IPCC's special report on climate change and land, and he is currently a coordinating lead author for the IPCC's Working Group 2 SIP assessment report. He's a member of NERC's scientific committee, and since 2022, David's been co-chair of the UK Climate Programmes Knowledge Network. So, David, over to you. Joseph, thank you very much. Um, and everyone, good afternoon. Um, and for those who further field, uh, good day. Um, Oh, uh, fantastic. Uh, Joseph and colleagues at the IES, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me along to this talk. It's fascinating. I've, you know, being involved in climate change, you know, we look forward. Um, I've been looking forward for, well, Joseph said uh, nearly 30 years, well, it's over 30 years now. Um, looking forward to what's going to happen and what, how, how the climate system will manifest itself with response to human-induced climate forcing. Coupled to that is how it will in fact impact upon everything else. Um, again, it's <clears throat> and it is ingrained in me that you know climate change is the biggest challenge we face. Um, we don't solve climate change, we don't solve anything else. The rest becomes irrelevant. It's paramount that we have to tackle climate change and we have to move forward very rapidly. Um, but in terms of you know the trends, let's just start with some of the observed changes we've seen, the observed trends. Um, we know that a lot of these diagrams are taken out of the IPCC reports. They're all available. Again, if you're not access the summary for policymakers of the, the three recent IPCC reports and the, the recent special reports, I'd, I'd really encourage you to do so. And also for anyone um, even thinking about it, if you can get an opportunity to get involved in the IPCC process or any of the big international processes, especially you know early career professionals, then I'd really encourage you to do so. It's a fantastic experience. It can be hard work. But it is very rewarding in terms of what you get out of it, what you can learn, and the range of breadth of colleagues that you need. But we've seen global net anthropogenic emissions have risen 
and it continued to rise. Um, we know what the sources are. We know the consumption of fossil fuels, burning of them, other associated things, cement production, fertilizer production, etc. Land use change, but they're going up, and they've been going up for well since really the start of the industrial revolution. From that, we know the temperature is changing. We know the observed changes go way beyond anything we've seen in human history. Um, if you think about this, this um, the graph on the left in particular, um, we're going through the warmest multi-century period in, the, in, in more than 100,000 years ago. 100,000 years ago, we shared this planet with six other species of Homo. Um, we're the only one left. We've assimilated some of them into our DNA, but Homo sapiens has become the dominant species on the planet in that time. Um, and a lot of the change that occurred, as Penelope said, within the urbanization context within the last 8,000 years, really since the end of the last, last glaciation. Um, we know that current changes are increasing, temperature change is rising. We know it's down to human induced climate change, anthropogenic emissions of the greenhouse gases are, are changing the climate. This is extremely well documented. And these changes in the global system are manifesting themselves regionally. So again, if you look at the top graph here, this is warm, uh, hot extremes across the world. High temperatures extremes are increasing, um, with the exception of maybe um, east coast of North America and the southern tip of South America. Um, also associated with that is increasing heavy precipitation. Um, we know, based, down to basic laws of physics, the something called the clausius clapeyron relationship. That uh, is a warmer body of air, it holds more, more moisture, more moisture, more precip, more intense precip. Again, right across the world with the observational data we have, we know in intense in in increases in intense precipitation are occurring and they cause damage. Flash floods, you know, look at the pictures of those urban areas that Penelope shows. When heavy rain storms go through those, they cause an awful lot of damage. Um, and where these impacts occur, it's often the most vulnerable in whatever country are the ones who are most heavily impacted by such events. So we've seen observational changes in the climate system. We know what the observational impacts are. Um, we can see that in terms of increased intensity of extreme events. 2022 in the UK was an example of this, where our temperature broke 40 Celsius for the first, well, no, broke the previous record by over one Celsius. Um, 40 Celsius was breached in 2018, um, but now we can see what happened. We can see the impact that had on this country, what is meant to be a developed, resilient country, place went into shutdown. Um, most things couldn't cope with that weather. Um, we saw profound impacts on the natural environment, large scale burning that we don't normally associate with the, with the British Isles, large areas of wild um, of landscape were burned. Villages, I live in North Norfolk, there's two or three villages that were severely burned by where a large number of houses burned down. Not far from me were Winter Watch and Spring Watch are filmed. At Snettisham, there was 258 uh, hectares burned. So these things are impacting all over the world. And if you look at the biggest, bigger scale issues in California, the Australian fires, huge impacts from these extreme events. And they're getting more intense. Um, and we can see that in the observational record. Now, those changes in climate are impacting um, systems around the world. We can see globally there's changes in eco ecosystem structures, both in terrestrial freshwater ocean, species range shifts, and changes in time and phenology right across the world. These vary from region to region, but overall we have very high confidence in the trends that have happened and what's driving those trends. Now, looking forward, the future trends, Again, climate change is pervasive. But we're in this position that as a, as a global community, we can actually stop this. The, the, all the science says that we have the technology, we have the infrastructure, we have the resources, that we can stop the increase in glo anthropogenic global emissions of the green, greenhouse gases this century. That's what the science says. That's what the technology says. Doesn't need a magic bullet, doesn't need unicorns. Um, we're just using existing technology we can turn down the increasing curve of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Hugh mentioned 
you know, some of the pathways um, were committed probably to at least 1.8 degrees at current trajectory. We can still turn that down. There is, we are, there is a possibility this can change, um, but we really have to ratchet down emissions. Currently, um, as you mentioned, and there is a theme here, these three presentations, and it could, in some ways, it could be in the last one, in some ways, bad could be in the last one, but there's, uh, there's common areas amongst these, and we share common slides, even though there was no free discussion about what was in these slides uh, between, between the three of us. We know that if we carry on doing what we're doing now, we're going to hit over two and a half or more degrees Celsius of global temperature rise by the end of the century. And what does that mean? These are the burning embers diagrams from working group two. Um, they were the first put in the IPCC in about 2001, the third assessment report. The, the methodology has been made more robust. The um, range of systems they've been put over is, is, is far more now because we've got more evidence. So these are the key global indicators. We know um, that once we get where we are now, what just over one degree is above uh, long-term, the pre-industrial, we are going. We are seeing impacts on unique and threatened ecosystems. Very high risks. We are seeing the loss of those ecosystems. Some of those um, unique ecosystems now. The montane regions, the alpine regions, are examples of that. Small islands and other examples. We are seeing the impact on extreme weather events, and they are increasing with every bit of global warming. These will increase. The distribution impact is becoming global. Nowhere is immune, nothing is immune from the impacts of climate change. Global aggregate impacts are increasing. And these large scale singular events, the ones that could cause catastrophic, irreversible damage, the shutdown of the thermal insulate uh, circulation, the dieback of the Amazon rainforest, the melting of the permafrost and release of methane from those are all increasingly uh, putting our future at risk and the future of the natural system. And I see I haven't had a chance to look at all the comments in the chat, but one of the first ones was about biodiversity. Again, biodiversity, the trends in that are negative. Um, and they are being driven by human activity, whether it's the direct impact of humans going and cutting things down, jumping on down, building on things, or whether it's the indirect impact through climate change. Um, biodiversity is on a, on a hugely downward trajectory. So it is a trend, um, again, driven by a whole range of different impacts. Um, but climate change is amongst the one of the key ones there. So we're at a, I wouldn't say crossroads, because I think we passed that. Um, we can go forward and what are the trends over the coming 10, 20, 30 years. Well, it depends what we do. I mentioned from the outset we have an opportunity to stop things now, not stop, sorry, not stop things, slow down the rate of change. We're gonna hit and be a platform where even if we stop all emissions now, that's still way above what we used to, way above what the natural world is used to, um, and the changes have occurred in such a, a short space of time. So this is the linkage of, you know, in the back of the Working Group 2 report with the links in with climate re resilient development pathways. So we want to go on a, a warming that's limited to around 1.5 degrees, where we put in place the right adaptation to protect the natural world and human systems, or are we going to go on this increased warming path where we have adaptation limits, where the sustainable development goals are completely undermined? So we are at this choice now, and that is in our realm. It's not we're not at a point of no return, but where every day, every year, every extra ton of CO two getting put into the atmosphere takes us further down this bottom path, this red path. Um, so we have that trajectory that we're on. Um, we can change it and we can put in place the actions that can make that difference. Just a couple of things out the, um, the land report. These are links in with Hugh and Penelope's speak, uh, talks. Agricultural production has gone up. We are extremely efficient as a species of producing food, notwithstanding in this country and other developed countries, we chuck, in, chuck away half the food that's produced on the farm. Uh, but that's meant organic. Nitrogen fertilizer use to increase, cereal yields, yields have increased, irrigation water volumes have increased, and the number of ruminant livestock have rapidly increased over the last um, uh, 60 years. Food demand has gone up, but the population has increased, obesity has increased, total calories per capita has increased, but the number of underweight people has also increased. So we've seen that increase in um, 
divergence between the rich and poor. And then if you look at the uh, desertification and land degradation, I'm using this as a sort of proxy for everything, really, because um, you know, it talks about the future trends in all sorts, and I going back to biodiversity. We are seeing that population in areas experiencing de desertification has increased, dry land areas and drought anomalies increased, inland water extent has decreased, fresh water has, has decreased. The, amount of fresh water on the planet, the amount of fresh water available for nature has decreased. So all these huge indicators around what we're doing are on negative trajectories. And they are being driven enhanced by one resource use um, and, our, and climate change. So we've already seen this diagram. Great minds think alike, at least, well, I'm, I'm thinking the same as Penelope, so I'm happy. Um, so the planetary boundaries, I was going to do all lots of graphs about all these, all the, make all the big changes. I think these sum it up really that we have planetary boundaries that will put a, a limit to what we can do. Or don't don't count for a limit. They they are they're a physical finite, they're a physical limit. They're a finite limit for a safe operating space, not just for humanity, but for nature on the planet. Um, and we all know that we are having a, an impact on all of these planetary boundaries. And we're doing that in a rapid way and increasingly harmful way. So that's just a bit of a run through of the big trends. And it's not, you know, I, mean, I was talking to someone yesterday about being involved in joking that I've been involved in climate change for 30 odd years and we still haven't solved the problem. Well, we haven't. Um, and they said, aren't you depressed? They said, oh, well, I've got other ways of getting out of that uh, look um, to doing, uh, doing my personal life. So, some way, yeah, it is depressing. Um, I have a family, I want them to grow up in a, an environment which is safe and secure, but not just them, but for all, all the peoples of the planet and all, all, the, all the natural world as well. Um, so environmental scientists, and you know, we're here as a part of the Institute of Environmental Science, we have a role to play. Um, and I think it's a big role and an increasing role. In the past, maybe environmental science was seen as you know, a little bit of a, a Cinderella type profession. Um, we know now that environmental science and the need for environmental science scientists is increasing right across all sectors of society. Um, there's, there's a need for people with environmental science backgrounds to be able to translate the science, the science of climate change, the science around biodiversity into practical solutions. Um, and importantly, understanding the risks. And once we understand the risks that climate change poses and the trend that climate change poses, we can put in place the right pathway, um, change those negative down trends into more positive ones to help improve not just the lives of the people on the planet, but also ensure that the ecosystem health is kept to its maximum capacity possible as well. So environmental science have a huge role to play in this. So I think it's a very exciting time to get involved, but it's also one which is you know, tackling some of the biggest, you know, biggest challenges that you know, the, the biosphere, the cryosphere, the, the, the living systems on this planet faces. So that's the very quick run through. Um, and finally, you know, the other trend that we have to look at goes beyond my expertise in a way is that even if we tackle, even if we go on that downward trajectory for greenhouse gas emissions, even if we keep the temperature below one and a half, even get it down to three today levels, we've got the, we've got the problem of, of resource use. So it's all great. And, Good saying, okay, we can put in place all the energy system, we can decarbonize the energy system, but if we still carry on increasing the, in using resources, natural resources at our current rate, again, we hit other barriers. Um, and that's partly driven, and Penelope showed this with the GDP thing and the economy thing, that we, we measure success by GDP growth. GDP growth is a proxy for resource consumptions. You will increase GDP quick, more quickly by using more resource. So we have to decouple those two to make sure that we can move forward. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, David, uh, for, for that great presentation. Lots of really interesting detail in there on the, the science behind the trends. But I think also perhaps you've, you've given us a little bit of cause for some, some maybe conditional optimism. That is our ability to see a positive route forward if we can take some serious science led action if environmental science plays a key role in that future, uh, with the important caveat, of course, that, that change is already and has already been taking place. So we'll have a chance to put 
questions to the panel in just a little bit, but right now we really want to capture all of your reflections while they're still fresh in your minds. To that end, we'll now be shifting into breakout discussions. So the three questions we're going to be asking in those discussions, how do you think that your group's focus area will affect the future of the environmental sciences? How do you think other megatrends will affect the future of the environmental sciences? And what can we do to maximize our chance at a positive future in the context of those trends? Great, well, thank you all for the, the breakout discussions. Uh, we're gonna very quickly hear a brief, quick summary from each group on what was discussed to give you a flavor of what happened in the other room, but we won't do too much detail on this, just enough to give us a sense of things before we go into the Q&A. Really four main areas, although we, we, we covered huge terrain, and one is, you know, biodiversity, ecosystem services, the basic fabric that supports everything else it was sort of conspicuously absent from the summary. So there was a, a sense that that was really vital. Um, and and the way that many societal activities undermine uh, that, that absolutely fundamental resource, and beneath that, the economic drivers that drive the drivers. So uh, we, you know, we, we, we're living in a complex and, and degrading system. The second sort of theme was more demo demographic in that, you know, we might be reaching population peak quicker than we thought. And with urbanization happening, does that give us opportunity in the rural hinterland to rebuild vital ecosystem services? Although we have to be mindful that growth of the middle class as a proportion of society doesn't mean that consumption reduces even if population peaks. The third theme I've sort of summarized and apologies for doing it so quickly group is 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 the monetarism model narrow capitals in dominating markets uh, and we all know that 80 percent of consumption is by 20 percent of, of the richest and all of these um, sort of bad metrics but we need to reimagine value we need to sort of take on board kate kate Raworth's type uh work and and, and recognize that value is more than money traded in the global system that continues to consume the very resource that it uh it trades upon um uh so yeah a broader ESG or, or wider framing of value and benefits um, that, you know, corporates will benefit more by, by taking better account of wider capitals. Uh, employees will be more satisfied in a, in a company that uh, embodies its values and a, a focus on solutions, not just highlighting the problems of overconsumption, which suggests us moving more into a social space than the hard-lined environmental space that many of us come from to communicate economically, um, democratically, demographically, and so forth. Uh, that fourth um, sort of summary area, societal attitude change, again, it relates to how we perceive value. Um, will we in future see rising generations polarized towards being more hyper-eco-aware or more disillusioned, dystopian, and disconnected. We, we couldn't judge which way that would go. But as environmental scientists, we should be much more connected with touchy-feely, the way people connect and think about their futures and their lives. And instead of, you know, focusing on the dystopia if we do things wrong, to paint rich pictures of a more attractive life that offers a better future than the one that is predicated on that uh, monetarist cons consumptive type of paradigm, because it's that that will drive paradigm change, that will drive non-specialist choice. Um, and, and that applies not just to people in general, but, but to financial institutions that are already driving businesses to think about different scenarios of you know, resource conserving, resource um, valuing, as opposed to ongoing consumption that can only lead to stranded assets and uh, and financial decline. Great, thank you. It's, it sounds like a great uh, summary of things. Um, in terms of uh, my group, um, I, I'll give a quick summary of what we talked about. We had, I'd say, roughly four sets of observations in the group, which are connected by the initial observation that both of the conversations around climate change and urbanization are very interlinking and very connected 
not only in terms of their drivers, but also potentially in some of the ways that we interact with them. The first observation then, the first conversation we had in the group was about the gaps between uh, science policy and some of these specific decision making tools. And this would eventually become a conversation about planning, which I'll talk about in a moment. But some of the gaps that exist in there, and we also had some comments in the chat as we went through about trying to find an integrated approach to policy that brings in some of the wider considerations on this, but specifically the need in the future to have somewhere that science fits in at the evidence stage into some of these conversations and how that may factor into the future of our ability to deal with urbanization, climate change and their consequences. As I say, that brought us into a second conversation then, which was largely about the planning systems, particularly in the UK and England, but in a broader context than that as well, uh, globally. And we talked a lot about England, we talked a lot about Scotland, but some of the uh, trends that we noticed are perhaps more, more applicable than that. And that is that in many ways, the environment has become divorced from planning in a lot of contexts and that where planners might rely on guidance, it might prevent them from engaging in better than uh, rules or, or moving beyond the minimum standards for fear of how that guidance may then lead to lawsuits or anything like that. And that the, the, the upshot of this being a reticence to move forward with environmentally friendly movements and some degree to which planning in general isn't working in the ways we'd want it to, such that when we have urbanization, for all the reasons Penelope said in, in her presentation, we don't necessarily get the better end of it, that, but there perhaps might be a better way in that. And throughout this conversation, we talked about the differences between density and beauty. We talked about roundabouts being at the wrong end of town. And we talked about how all of these conversations come together fundamentally with the view that we do have a duty to address these kind of risks and we ought to be able to but that the personal experience of our natural systems means that we often don't see the functions, the ecosystem services when we engage in planning. The third conversation we had then was about climate and the need for not just technological solutions, but perhaps more holistic ones that deal with the systems of consumption and production underpinning this. And the role that adaptation plays in that, particularly in urban environments where it's been, it's been a dirty word in the past and hasn't been able to proceed to the same extent that mitigation against climate change has and the need for that in the future where environmental science will play an important role. Finally, then we talked about the global dimension of urbanization and the vicious cycles inequity that need to be broken in order to address it. The disconnection between air quality and climate that maybe existed in the past and the ways we can, we've can we been able to overcome that and maybe potentially we'll be able to overcome other challenges in the future. And what that means then for transport systems, the way that we need more active travel, we need more public transport, not only to help deal with climate change and some of the consequences of urbanization for the environment, but also to be able to deal with the wider issues here. And where that left us off then after those themes is with one final observation about trends that we hadn't had a chance to talk about separately, which was about chemical pollution and contamination, which it's often said to be the third leg of the stool of biodiversity loss, climate change, and then chemical pollution and pollution and uh, waste more generally, um, and how we'll be able to move forward with that conversation in the future as well. So a uh, very well, broad and wide ranging conversation from us. And it sounds like the same is true of the other groups. So uh, thank you for those uh, comments. Thank you for those discussions. They sound extremely useful and fruitful. For now, though, um, we've now had a chance to discuss. And so we'll be bringing in the panel to answer your questions. Global conversations around science. How might those evolve to help us interact with these mega trends? I mean, I think intergovernmental panels do seem to be um, multiplying. Um, and that's probably a good sign. Um, it, in the sense that it's better that people are talking than not. Um, many of them do seem to make incredibly slow progress, um, but they, there seems to be a, um, very many dimensions to that. Um, so, so yes, I, don't, I think if you're having an intergovernment panel on pollution, then that's a great, great idea. So, I mean, that, the other thing we were talking about, about successes and and do i mean the, the success of um the panel on ozone emissions perhaps ought to be held up as one one great um intergovernmental um achievement um yeah promulgated as a model for lots of other things as well you know i've been as you mentioned i've been involved in the ipcc for getting on 30 years and um you know you must get what the purpose of these panels are it's, it's not to provide they're not policy prescriptive they're not there to set out policies in fact anything that you know when you write the reports that indicate you're suggesting policy will get scrubbed out by the government um, they're there to provide the evidence base 
that the governments and the policymakers can then refer to. So that's their prime role. Um, they are, you know, 30 years, well, six, so every five or six years, we have an IPCC assessment cycle. The seventh assessment cycle is just about to kick off, uh, which will be reported in about 2028. Um, but they're there to provide that scientific evidence. Behind me, I've got what I prepared earlier, which is the land report. And as she said, you know, this is this is a short one. This is a thousand pages of text based upon 40,000 research articles. And this is the small one, the AR6, the working group 2 one, which is going to be twice the size, 80,000 research articles. And that the amount of research is increasing exponentially as well. So as long as these things do a good job of summarizing the research and condensing hundreds of thousands of research papers into 40 pages, which is SPM is the summary for policymakers, then they are a good thing. My question got lost in the in, in the chat, and it was specifically for Pe uh, Penelope, about whether there is a more positive view for uh, rapid urbanisation, which is that um, density up to a certain level, and I realise there are thresholds around this, um, should be more resource efficient. Um, so if we can con concentrate a plateauing population within urban centres, um, should that reduce resource use, and in addition, give us greater flexibility about what we do with rural areas. You can imagine you know, parts of the country being given over to rewilding, for example. You, you can always be optimistic uh, in these things because there are always some good examples. But I think the, the problem is that we have this massive knowing doing gap. We know what works, but we don't do it. Uh, and you, we can build individual new developments. I'm talking very much in the English context. You can build individual new developments, but you've got a huge town that's next to it that needs to be retrofitted for it all to work together. And there's no system in the way that our current economy, our economic system is set up to get that money into the existing town. So um, it would be fine if we didn't have any <laughs> and we could start from scratch. Um, we could build the most amazing places. And I don't think density is part of it. Um, but but being able to travel without the as we were talking about in our uh, breakout group, being able to get what you need in the local area, it doesn't mean to say you have to be, build at particularly massive densities um, to get the right volume of population in a local area. But we know what we need to do. We just don't do it. Great, Penelope. Thank you for that answer. Um, before we come to Ian's question, uh, we've got a comment in the chat from Elaine. Uh, I'm not expecting any magic bullets, but it seems that policy and guidance to bring environmental aspects more into planning are not working very well in all areas. Do the panel think this is something where the response should be lobbying for stricter enforcement, or is there a carrot as opposed to a stick that can be implemented? While, while you think about that, then we'll let uh, Ian have a chance to ask a question, and then maybe we can take both of them. We can do answers at the same time. So, Ian, what's your question? My, my question, uh, and it's two, two parts, one of which was again lost beforehand, uh, is about um, public perceptions of science um, and how much people, and it links in also to how much people will actually take action of their own accord. Um, there is a very strong stream of populism that tends to denigrate science. Um, you know, it, it, we, we, we see it sort of at one extreme with sort of President Trump and using disinfectant up his nostrils or something in order to fight COVID. But there, there, there is quite a strong anti-scientific consensus um, that, that I, I see as being a trend that's very much more so now than a few years ago. And linked into that, just before the breakout rooms, someone made a comment about the fact that young people, you know, young people are much more aware of, of the problems around climate change. And, and even if it, they are a bit despairing, not always taking action. I also see the other side, and I see quite a lot of young people who can't care tuppence about it. Um, and, you know, for every Greta Thunberg, there's probably half a dozen sort of influencers on YouTube who are sort of demonstrating their bling and sort of chunky gold jewellery and driving their BMWs at high speed around the roundabouts. Um, and again, I, I am concerned as to how we can get over the message that, look, guys, this is serious. And if we don't do something about it, you know, you won't be able to do all the other things you want to do. So there's sort of linked questions there on that. I'll I'll pick up Elaine's uh, question. I think it I, th I think we need to go back a whole step with the planning system. We don't when you when you're doing a local plan for a local authority as part of the British planning system, you don't start with the environmental carrying capacity of that piece of land. 
you start with which developers have got what pl plots of land and how many houses do you need. So we start from the wrong base. And I think we need to have, try and have a conversation that, that, that changes it fundamentally from saying, well, across the nation, we need this number of houses. And that means that we divvy them up in this way. And you go off and find the housings, so the sites for housing. It, you would, would, we're, so, so Elaine asked the question, do, does the panel think that there's something where the response should be lobbying for stricter enforcement? Well, I think there's no point in trying to get something better out of the current system because it's fundamentally not looking at it from an environmental perspective. Yeah, just picking up, I won't talk about the planning bit, but just picking up Ian's point about um, the message. I think that's been a challenge that the academic community has faced in the, in the climate context since we started talking about it in the late 1980s, that the picture we present is not a good one. So we do have this doom and gloom type approach and that turns people off. Um, now, <clears throat> it's quite hard to get a positive message to try and dig out what's positive apart from the fact we can actually change it. So when we realize if we, we stick on the existing pathway, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be good. There's no joyous solidity uplands ahead of us. Um, it's, it's not, it's not as, it's a bit more bleak than that. So getting that positive message to engage more and more people. I guess it comes back to this ownership, you know, the individuals need to take ownership of that land, not on a, not on a okay, you can say it anyway, they need to take ownership of it somehow, whether it's the, morally spiritually it has to be monetary or other, other means they need to think they have that connect to the land and the environment so they feel that the damage to it is damaging them at the moment that's well disconnected because everyone's because very few people are experiencing what the environment can bring thank you i was going to just jump back to the question that you were asking joseph at the start and see what the panel thought to do with this kind of idea of uh you know more and more intergovernmental panels popping up all over the place uh, and just to clear an interest, having worked in DEFRA, I kind of know some of the history behind the, um, and indeed the politics behind the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Chemicals and Hazardous Waste that's been mooted. Um, but just to say also um, that I was involved in a review of UNEP's Global Environmental Outlook um, a few years ago. And um, this is a kind of opportunity to create uh, a kind of all seeing assessment. Because the trouble with the global environmental assessments that go on is that they're tied to very specific instruments, the multilateral environmental agreements. So, you know, David's brilliant work with IPCC is tied to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The work that I do with IPBES is tied to the Convention on Biodiversity. You know, but fundamentally, these are all part of a bigger system. And so there is a kind of integrated governance question. And so there is an opportunity for, for, for GEO to kind of fill, fill that space. But my question really is, is how do how do the panel kind of see the importance of really kind of or, and the balances and the trade-offs really between the need to ensure that these assessments are credible scientifically, um, that they're relevant to the interests of the people that we're trying to address, and that they are fundamentally legitimate in the eyes of the people that we're trying to influence. And I just refer to the difference really in the way that IPCC works to the way that IPBES works, particularly as IPBES is kind of deliberately set out to uh, to engage with um, indigenous and local knowledge um, and local communities, um, and really understand things from a from a, a wider perspective than what you might call kind of the normal science approach. Thank you, Gary. So we've got a question there, but I'm going to bring it to you as well with one from the chat from Cheryl, who's asking if we think policy decisions are actually being based on science and evidential data, or if they're being based on other political purposes. Well, yeah, Gary, that's a, that's a very insightful question. So, you know, one thing these big reports do and the big assessments do is provide the evidence, and they're done in the most robust and thorough way. You know, no other area of science gets as, gets put through the ring as much as um, as climate science. And having sat in on the um, government reviews, the final two weeks of the process where government are going through those summary of policymakers line by line, you know that you know that getting scrutinised by all governments. Um, so one thing you can do with them is say, look, government, you've signed up to this, you've agreed with this report, you can't ignore it. Um, so you've got something to hit the government with um, and because they, they've agreed to that science. I just Can I just also say there's there a point there just, I just saw it in the chat from um, Mohammed, Mohammed Khan. Um, look, it doesn't matter, Mohammed, if you're a sixth former or not, your voice is as, as credible and relevant as anyone else's. So... Don't feel quite, don't ever 
not speak because um, it's really important we hear from a, a very diverse range of, of people. So thank you for your comments and thank you for taking part in this. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, young people are the, the you know, it's, it's oh, this is cliche beyond belief, but it's your plan, it's your future. Um, you've got to have a say in it. And unfortunately, the people making the decisions don't have much of a stake left in the future of the planet because they're not going to be around much longer. I was just, I just spotted Mohammed's comment as well. I think it was really quite important in terms of the conversation we had earlier about how um, the generations and cohorts aren't um, changing their views so much as they age at the moment, that they are actually carrying through their uh, optimism into the future. And I think that harnessing that is one of the, the trends that we should be trying to, or one of the themes that we ought to be trying to pull the political things around. Because I, I think, you know, I painted out those six top level demographic concepts. And the idea is, I think, really is how do you work with those trends in order to achieve what you want to achieve? You've got to, you know, you're accepting that the aging populations have. What are the opportunities that that presents? You're accepting that social attitudes are changing. What are the opportunities? Even even in the geopolitical conflict, you can find some opportunities. So that that, to my mind, is is a way of, of looking at this, rather than just throwing your hands up in horror and saying, you know, there are trends happening. How can we harness them? I'm just going to pull uh, two more out. The first one is one that comes from APTAB, which is about citizen science and the role it can play in terms of addressing climate change and urban planning. The question is, do uh, environmental scientists uh, buy into the concept of citizen science, knowing that the evidence gathered may be largely unpublished in many cases? Um, the, I think it's a really interesting question, but at the moment in in planning, we don't use citizen science at all. I'm, I'm not aware of, a, of an example where a local plan would be relying on citizen science for something. Let's let's explore that because that is very often one of the reasons why we don't take environmental carrying capacity and that sort of thing into account because you don't actually have the data locally. You don't have that monitoring of what's going on in your river or whatever. So that's a really great idea. I'll bring us on to a final question then, which is going to be the one that's really captured the spirit of imagination of the commenters, because we've had quite a long conversation on this in the chat, which is all around communication and engagement with science. Um, there's a lot of other questions we didn't have a chance to get to, but I think if we end on this one, my question to each of the three panelists then will be, in a sentence, what message for communication would you hope comes out of not just the science, but the broader set of conversations we've had today? What is your final message of communication then in aid of that broader goal? Yeah, I think, um, you know, getting the communication is important um and yeah we've seen the big global polls on acceptance of okay i'm focusing on climate science um increasing people are, people accept it what they the challenge is how they deal with it mm -hmm. and i think getting that positive message that one they can make a difference uh, individually but also collectively and i'm just picking up a little bit about citizen science again you know citizen science has been used for a long time if you go back to a lot of studies on phenology it's based upon you know, a vicar in X parish going back in, 90, in the 1700s um, doing making recordings. Um, so citizen science is around and used by the academic community, but also let, I think there may be an issue there about conflating citizen science and citizen action or activism, um, because I know where I live in Kingsley, there's a big big issues around pollution of one of the chalk rivers, um, and that's getting XR Extinction Rebellion are picking that one up. So they're, they're raising that as an issue. Um, so citizen science is, is useful. One, you know, got to have the evidence base for it and go through the scientific rig, rigor, making sure it's uh, the data is reliable. But citizen involvement and engagement is, is crucial to how we move forward. And that relies on good communication. I, th I think my, my take on this whole business of engagement and communication is that we all need to see ourselves in the organisations of which we're part as change agents. And everything that we do every conversation that we have not communicate the gloom but communicate the solutions i didn't do that particularly in my presentation today i must admit but um so wh when one is buying one's coffee you know in buying an almond latte rather than a normal latte one is making a, a statement and other people will hear it and just tiny tiny things always be it, trying to be that change agent yes i i think Picking up on the engagement and, and taking an optimistic perceptive perception of things has to be a way forward to be sending out the messages, you know, I mean, that renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels anyway. So why wouldn't you 
shift, make the shift. Those are the, those are the sorts of things to pick up on, and try to build on the citizen science. And I agree with Penelope that every individual action matters, and that, that it has a groundswell of the effect. And to avoid a, and try to avoid a, a fatalism of well, it's all gone wrong. Um, there's no point in doing anything because every small percentage point of a degree change matters, uh, and every little thing you can do to stop that also matters. Thank you all for that. I'm afraid that's all that we have time for. Thank you all for the conversations, for the very lively chat and all of the conversations and discussions that preceded it. There's a lot of megatrends affecting the future. They're affecting it in quite complicated ways. Environmental science certainly has a role in, in quite a few of them. But then the final message is that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. We've got a lot of uncertainty about whether or not we should be optimistic or pessimistic. But based on those comments we've just had uh, from the three speakers, I think absolutely we need to find a way to convey that optimistic, positive vision for the future, even if we're feeling a little bit uncertain about how optimistic we need to be. So thank you all again for attending, participating, for sharing your views and your questions. Uh, thank you especially to Hugh, Penelope and David for setting us up so well by sharing your expertise and for such a great and helpful panel discussion at the end there. Everything we've discussed today will help inform our work throughout the year as we produce our vision statement for the future of the environmental sciences. If you'd like to be involved in those discussions, please get in touch and we can discuss how best to work together or integrate your perspective. This marks the end of our theme on megatrends specifically. So next week, we'll be starting by shifting our focus to the very broad question of the science, uh, where we'll be looking at emerging science, where we'll be looking at research and development, and crucially as well, that relationship between science and society we've been talking about today. Thank you for everyone logging in and participating. I hope you found it to be a beneficial and informative discussion. Don't forget to record your attendance at this webinar and RCPD tool if you're an IES member by logging into our IES members area. If you're watching the recording on YouTube in the future, uh, please subscribe to our channel, like the video and share it with your friends and colleagues. If you've enjoyed today's uh, event, we have a few more coming up later this month. On the 15th of February, we have a webinar taking us from net zero to combustion transition to embracing our biosphere, learning to thrive sustainably. And then at the end of the month, we're running a session of policy training on land and nature, which still has one or two more open places if you're interested in engaging in land and nature policy. You can sign up for all three right now on the IES website. If you've enjoyed today's discussion, please do consider joining the IES as a member. For now, thank you again to Hugh, to Penelope, to David, and thank you to everybody for attending and taking part. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you and goodbye.